All right. Hi, everyone. Um, this is on, right? Yeah. Um, OK, so I, I wasn't really, I didn't know much about the audience when I prepared this. Um, in particular, I see a lot more students than I thought there were going to be when I was making the slides. Um, so uh, I, tried to, I tried to have it be aimed at a broad audience, but maybe not broad enough. And so the, the fix to that is just, you know, don't be shy about asking questions. Um, you know, the way this goes, it kind of gets to more recent and specialized things towards the end. And so if we just don't get to those things, that's OK with me. Um, I would rather uh, have people get things out of it however far we go. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about this general topic of quantum information and space-time emergence, kind of more from the point of view of a review of the context of the field, what the problems are, um, rather than you know trying to tell you the latest things that happened last week. Um, so um, if we want to understand the emergence of space-time, um, well, the first thing we should think about is why space-time is emergent, right? Why isn't space-time just fundamental? Um, so based on our understanding of the other forces of nature, electromagnetism and so on, if you, you know, went to an undergraduate and you said, construct for me a quantum theory of gravity, um, well, if it, was a, if it was a pretty good but not too good undergraduate, what they would probably say um, is that you should take the space-time metric, g mu nu, which is the dynamical field of gravity, um, and just promote it to a Heisenberg operator acting on a Hilbert space. Um, you know, and if they were a little bit better of a student, they might say, and you have to be careful about gauge constraint, and it's not really diff invariant, and so on, but that's secondary. Um, or they might say, well, instead of talking about operators on Hilbert space, we should just do a functional integral over g mu nu, because that's how we quantize other classical theories. And so it stands to reason that that's also how we should quantize gravity. Um, so I would say either of these approaches, the operator approach or the, the path integral approach, um, views space-time as fundamental. The, the fundamental degrees of freedom of the theory is a metric and some matter fields, and they live on a space-time. And that space-time is just part of telling you what the degrees of freedom are. Um, so um, you know, this is a thing you can try. Attempts to do this uh, include this general program of asymptotic safety. You know, or maybe the sort of what I view as a special case of asymptotic safety, which is loop quantum gravity. Um, now, um, and we should we clearly should should, you know, if this works, then that's what we should do, right? We shouldn't we shouldn't try to do something fancier. Um, and in fact, in low dimensions, say in in one plus one dimensions, um, and possibly in two plus one dimensions with no matter, um, this is feasible. You can just have a theory of gravity that's based on a path integral over metrics or, uh, or viewing the metric as an operator on a Hilbert space. Um, but in three plus one dimensions or in higher dimensions or, or even in two plus one with matter or even really in one plus one with matter, if you're careful enough, um, this approach is, does not seem feasible. It doesn't seem feasible to have a metric theory of gravity, um, you know, where space time is fundamental. Um, and uh, in fact, in string theory, um, which is sort of our best general framework for thinking about quantum gravity, although it's still incomplete, has problems, um, you know, even in these low dimensional cases, right, the ones that we can construct, the low dimensional examples we can construct in string theory, actually the space time is still emergent. Um, so um, why is this, right? Why does space time have to be emergent um, in realistic theories of quantum gravity. So let's first go through some of the things that you may have heard, but which I would say are not the reason. Okay. So one reason that you, know, you often encounter first time you learn about it is that gravity is non-renormalizable. Um, and certainly there's at least some correlation with this, right? Because these low dimensional gravity theories where you can make sense of the functional integral over the metric, they are renormalizable theories of gravity, um, while the examples where we know that space-time is emergent, they're not renormalizable. So there's at least some 
correlation here. Um, you know, on the other hand, in field theory, you meet non-renormalizable theories all the time, right? You know, the Fermi theory, the chiral Lagrangian, et cetera. Um, and what you do with them is you just UV complete them into other quantum field theories that are renormalizable. Um, and indeed, this idea of asymptotic safety is just the proposal that maybe that's what happens with gravity. So it looks non-renormalizable, but really it just flows to strong coupling at short distances, and there's some strongly interacting fixed point of some kind. Okay, that's the proposal of asymptotic safety. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't view this as a, as a killer argument that we need to tear up everything that we know about space-time. Um, something that's a little more special to gravity is diffeomorphism invariance, right? In order to have a theory of gravity that reduces to Einstein gravity in the classical limit, um, you need to have general covariance, right? Gen general coordinate transformations or diffeomorphism should be gauged symmetries. Um, and so physical observables have to be non-local. In a diff invariant theory, um, well, roughly speaking, you can't have local observables. Um, the only exception is a local observable, which is a constant. It's the same everywhere, um, which is not what I see in this room when I look around. Um, so um, this is sometimes argued, you know, the dealing with the diff invariance has occasionally argued to be some form of holography or somehow saying that space-time is emergent. A hydrodynamic is a word people sometimes use. Um, you know, on the other hand, right, also in quantum field theory, uh, one sec, let me just finish the sentence. In, in topological field theories, you know, those can certainly be generally, I mean, they are generally covariant um, without having emergent space-time. Space-time is definitely not emergent. Uh, in topological field theory, um, you know, and and also in these low dimensional gravi gravitational theories that I just discussed, right? You have diff invariance without having emergent space time. Yeah, Frank, you had a question. Yeah. Can you um, yeah. So so uh, so so say you want to measure the electric field here, right? So in in, in quantum electrodynamics, that's a fine gauge invariant local observable. But in gravity, what does here mean? If I just say, you know, it's where the x coordinate is 7 and the y coordinate is 10 and the z coordinate is 6, then what does that mean? Because I can change the coordinates, right? So to say what here is, I have to define it relationally. You know, so Einstein talked about rods and clocks, right, filling space. Or you can try to do it, for example, by having an asymptotic boundary and shooting a geodesic and saying, oh, it happens at the end of the geodesic or something like that. But just to say where you are in a, in a diff invariant theory is a non-local business. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, there, there'll be another one, another gauge invariant non-local operator which tells you about the electric field there if there's one here, right? But then if I, for example, if I say where it is by finding a geodesic, if I put a planet over here or something, then now those geodesics may end up in different places with regard to some coordinates, right? But that's fine, just coordinates. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, so th this has to do with whether you think about diffeomorphisms actively or passively. Okay, I think it's, as with many things, it's good to be active when you think about symmetries. Um, so yeah, so you have some abstract manifold that has a point, right? But then the thing is, if I give you some metric field configuration and matter field configuration on that, physically it's the same configuration if I move all that stuff by applying a diff. So that now, you know, the, what used to be the electric field at this point is now the electric field at that point. And physically, there's no way to distinguish between those, between those configurations. So somehow, when you abstractly presented the manifold and you defined the point P, you actually did use some coordinates to do that. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, well, not quite. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, I, no, but I think you have to say where one of the points is. What you said is not diff invariant because, because I still don't know. I mean, I might know the, the distance between them, but I still need to know where the whole dumbbell is. Oh, if you integrate, no, if you integrate, it's fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, but then that's very non local, yes. Yeah. Yeah, certainly you can integrate over all of space, space and time. Yeah. Um, but that, that doesn't feel like what we do when we measure things. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so this is some discussion. So, I mean, these are, of course, important features of gravity. They're things we need to understand, but they're not the root of the problem. Okay. Um, so I would say, um, you know, something that we as a field have, you know, gradually learned at various levels over the last sort of order 30 years um, is that the real reason why space-time needs to be emergent is in order to have a consistent quantum theory of black holes. Um, you know, so, and, and black holes really are special to gravity. You know, unlike diff invariance or non-renormalizability, which you can meet in some condensed matter system, um, you know, black holes, um, you're not going to meet, well, at least unless you say that the condensed matter system is somehow simulating quantum gravity, but then the black holes are living in some auxiliary emergent space-time, not the space-time that the condensed matter system is living in. Um, so what do I mean by a consistent quantum theory of black holes? Um, so I'm going to have three requirements for what I want. Um, the first is that I want there to be a finite dimensional Hilbert space of black hole microstates um, whose dimensionality is computed by some version of the Bekenstein-Hawking formula, which says that the entropy is the area of the horizon divided by 4G. Okay. Now, if you know a little bit too much, you can complain about this because you can say, well, in flat space, black holes evaporate, and so what do you really even mean by this ensemble? The black hole is just a resonance. Okay, if you want to make complaints like that, then we should do this in ADS um, so that the black hole is stable. Um, I think, roughly speaking, it should also be true in flat space, but there's a little bit more fuzziness about how you define the ensemble. Um, so this is a thing that I would like to be true. Um, if you ask me why, well, roughly speaking, it's because black holes behave as if this were true, right? They, they obey the laws of black hole thermodynamics. Um, and uh, why would they do that um, if they're not actually governed by thermodynamics? Um, Secondly, I would like that the formation, evolution, and evaporation of black holes um, is uh, unitary. Um, you know, possibly if the black hole is interacting with something else, then uh, unitary on the black hole together with the thing that it's interacting with, um, you know, as required by quantum mechanics. Okay. And this is just, you know, because, well, uh, you shouldn't modify quantum mechanics if you don't have to. Now, at the end of the talk, you'll actually... We, we may or may not get to the part where I have to admit that actually we are still modifying quantum mechanics. Um, but, you know, in the least possible way, we want to do it no more than necessary. Um, uh, and then finally, um, I would like it that the experiences of an observer who falls into a big black hole um, are governed by low energy effective field theory and the black hole background. Um, to all orders in G Newton or equivalently um, one over the size of the black hole in, in Planck units. Um, this is because you know, we think that effective field theory shouldn't break down unless you have some large energy density or curvature somewhere, um, and you don't have that near the horizon of a, of a big black hole. You have it at the singularity, and that's okay. I'm okay with it breaking down there, but it shouldn't break down away from the singularity. So, so these are just, you know, things that I would like, okay, things that a, a good quantum theory of black holes should do. Um, unfortunately, um, as Hawking realized kind of amazingly almost 50 years ago now, um, is that, you know, there's this very simple argument that you're not going to get all three of these things. You're going to have to give up on one of them. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what makes this problem so interesting. So um, let me try to explain Hawking's problem in a fairly conceptual way. Okay. So in one way to think about the information problem is that there's a basic tension 
between doing effective field theory and living in an expanding space time. So let's try to think about why. Well, in an expanding space time, you know, short wavelength modes, like maybe these lines are the, you know, the peaks and the troughs of some wave, um, they get stretched with time. You know, short wavelength modes get stretched into long wavelength modes um, as time goes on. Um, and so if you think that there's some kind of short distance cutoff around, like you should if you're doing effective field theory, um, you know, say maybe at the Planck scale, um, then in order to somehow preserve the physical cutoff scale, to say that the cutoff stays at the Planck scale, you have to introduce new modes into the system at short distances as the evolution goes on. Yeah, I guess I don't know of an analogous thing, for example, in condensed matter. It would be interesting if there is one, but certainly in quantum gravity, this is a thing that can happen. Um, and since you're introducing these new modes into the system, um, you need to have a rule to say what state you add them in. Okay? Without that, I mean, then you don't even know how to evolve the system. So um, the only rule which seems to make sense, um, as far as I can tell, you know, at least roughly speaking, is that the new mode should enter in their vacuum state. And we could make various arguments for that, but one would be that if they're not entering in their vacuum state, then you know the universe would be heating up and sounds unpleasant. Um, now, you may say that I just made that rule up. You know, come on, Daniel. Why do, why do you get to make that rule up? You know, shouldn't the laws of physics tell you what the rule is? Um, but here, this is one of the few cases where I actually get to say that this rule has been tested by observation, you know, unlike most of the things that I talk about for a living. Um, so in the, in the theory of inflation, um, the structure of the universe that we see today, right, this is, this is the cosmic microwave background, hopefully everyone recognizes the picture. Um, these are the temperature fluctuations from the Planck satellite. Um, so these fluctuations actually came from exactly these modes, you know, the vacuum fluctuations that were entering in the expanding universe um, during inflation. Um, and in fact, in, in typical models, you know, of inflation, say with 60 foldings, if you know what that means, um, then modes which before inflation were even within the Planck scale, um, today are, you know, at least sort of order meters in size. Um, so, in fact, we are all made out of subplankian modes. Um, at least if you believe the standard picture of the early universe. Let me stop and ask if there are questions before I say more. I'll, everyone's happy, having fun, not asleep from lunch. So, um, you know, I explain this in cosmology because it's a bit more intuitive, the expansion of the universe. Um, but the same thing also happens near black hole horizons. Um, so, okay, so this is a piece of a black hole space time. This dashed line is the horizon. Um, this horizontal line up here is the singularity. Uh, this diagonal line here is null infinity, where things, where photons go off to spend their um, golden years. Um, and um, well, what happens in the black hole space time is that if you go forward in time, they're in tangled modes straddling the black hole horizon, um, which start out very close, like say these blue modes, and then evolve away from the horizon. One half of the entangled pair falls in and hits the singularity. The other one goes out um, to future null infinity. Um, and, you know, so these red ones, they were close to the horizon a while ago, and then these orange ones a bit more recently, and then these blue ones are sort of just coming out. And then as time goes on, you get more and more of these pairs straddling the horizon. Um, and according to our rule, they should be entering in the vacuum state. So they should be entangled with each other in a non-trivial way um, to ensure that we have a sort of empty-ish empty space-time here with nothing too dramatic going on. Um, and if you 
if you play with the geometry and do a little calculation, you'll see that the time after, you know, so the time after the time where you form the black hole, um, at which these modes that are coming out are coming from a distance to the horizon, which is closer than the Planck scale, um, is this time which is called the scrambling time. Um, so it's the, the inverse temperature of the black hole, which is about the Schwarzschild radius, light crossing time, um, times the logarithm of the entropy of the black hole. And this time is, you know, it looks big maybe because there's the entropy of the black hole there, but it's inside the log, so it's not that big. I mean, in fact, if you compute it for Sagittarius A star, which hopefully you know is the black hole in the center of the Milky Way, um, you get that the scrambling time is about 1,000 seconds. Um, so Sagittarius A star has certainly been around for longer than 1,000 seconds. Um, and so modes from Sagittarius A star that are coming out are coming out from much closer to the horizon than the Planck scale. Um, and somehow, not, as far as we can tell, nothing too crazy is happening. Uh, now, OK, so that, that was some background. Now let's see how this picture um, leads us to Hawking's information paradox. Um, so entanglement between interior and exterior modes um, causes the black hole to radiate because these interior modes fall into the singularity and are sort of gone from the point of view of somebody living outside. And if you just look at these modes here, there's a flux of energy that's coming out through future null infinity. Um, now, the reason that that's kind of puzzling is because, so now this is the same diagram, but I just, I zoomed out to show more of the space time. So now down here is, is past null infinity where photons come from. Um, and so this is a black hole that's a very special black hole. I made it out of an infalling shell of photons. Um, and um, the horizon is this dashed line here. This yellowish region here is the region of the space-time that's behind the horizon. So, so the reason it's nice to draw the geometry this way is because light rays move on 45-degree lines um, in the geometry. Um, and so the, the key point to get from this figure is that the radiation that's coming out here is determined just by this rule that you should have the vacuum for these modes here. Whereas the information of how you made the black hole is riding in on this infalling shell over here. And so if you look on this time slice here, this dashed line, sometimes called a nice slice, whatever's going on here is space-like separated from the information about how you made the black hole over there. And so this process of vacuum, vacuum, vacuum it's, is going to give you radiation that doesn't remember anything about how you made the black hole. Um, uh, that shell is way inside over here. Um, now you might say, OK, well, maybe it's different once the black hole gets down to be Planckian size, then you shouldn't really believe this picture. But then by then, it doesn't have enough energy to return the information. And so Hawking argued that the information is just lost. It's, you know, it's still over here on this shell, but then this part of the space-time is somehow gone when the black hole finishes evaporating. Uh, and if you look at you know, the S matrix from my threw in the shell, and then what I got out was the Hawking radiation, and then that's, that can't be a unitary S matrix because you forgot um, how you made the black hole. So that's Hawking's paradox. Um, now let's recall our three principles that we wanted to have, right? So we wanted to have a finite black hole entropy given by the area over 4G. We wanted to have unitary black hole evolution. Um, and we wanted to have effective field theory valid away from high energy densities and or curvatures. And essentially what Hawking argued is that one plus three implies not two. Okay, that's uh, one way of phrasing his calculation. Um, now, if we're believers in the idea that space-time should be fundamental, right? That there should be an integral over metrics or you should have a metric operator, um, then you shouldn't give up on three, right? Effective field theory says, you know, the and if, certainly in effective field theory, there's a metric operator or an integral over metrics, okay? Um, so um, if, you wanna, if you don't wanna give up on three, then you're clearly gonna have to give up on one or two. Um, and in fact, that is what happens in the low dimensional examples that I mentioned above, um, where either um, the number of microstates is infinite um, or the evolution is not unitary on a fixed Hilbert space. It kind of depends in detail how you interpret 
examples which of those two you want to pick. Um, for the experts, it has to do with whether you view it as an average or not, or, or use the canonical approach. Um, and uh, similarly, with some of the traditional approaches called remnants and information loss, you give up on, on one and or two um, and try to keep three. Uh, and there are people who are still in that camp. You know, if you talk to Bob Wald or Bill Unruh, um, they'll tell you that um, you should give up on um, one and or two. The modern point of view, however, I would say, um, you know, the majority view among people who think about this is that it's really number three, which you should give up. Um, and that by giving up three, you're admitting that space time itself is an approximate notion, um, which only applies in certain situations. Um, so in other words, space time is emergent. Um, that's what giving up number three means. Um, now, before discussing how badly we need to give up three, let's first, um, let me just first mention some reasons about why we don't want to give up on number one or number two. Um, so one reason is that in string theory, you can count black hole microstates, um, both directly in some cases for supersymmetric black holes, um, and also through the ADS-CFT correspondence, um, and uh, whenever you can do the calculation, you always find that S is equal to A over 4G, that there really is a microscopic Hilbert space, uh, finite dimensional with this being the, you know, the log of the dimension. Um, also in ADS-CFT, there's pretty strong evidence that the black hole S matrix is unitary. Um, so that's in favor of, so these are arguments in favor of number one and number two. Um, now you could say, well, I don't care about string theory. I don't believe in ADS, CFT, et cetera, et cetera. And you're within your right to say that. And so let me give two other arguments. So one is that um, so far, if you do try to have space time be fundamental and give up on one or two instead of three, um, it doesn't work. Um, you know, in, in all the attempts to actually make a theory that does this outside of low dimensions, um, you just don't get a sensible theory where maybe one criterion for success would be, can you get the, does your theory have a controlled calculation of the two to two graviton scattering amplitude? Um, and um, if the answer is no, well, that's a much more basic test of your theory than getting the black hole entropy right. So go get that right first and then come back and we'll talk, okay? Um, also aesthetically, I said this before, but I'll say it again. I think it's important to have aesthetic principles also. Um, you know, it would really be a pity if black hole thermodynamics were fake. You know, why should black holes behave like they have the entropy over 4G if they don't? You know, in other words, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then probably it's a duck. Okay. Um, now, I want to emphasize how drastic the violation of effective field theory needs to be, right? Because may maybe emergent space-time is too grandiose of a description. Maybe you just need to mess up effective field theory a little bit, you know? A few small violations here and there and everything is fine. If that were true, we probably wouldn't say that we've torn down all the structure of space and time. Okay. Um, but that's not good enough, right? Now, the most extreme modification that has been proposed um, now um, more than 10 years ago, which dates me, um, is that um, you just say the interior is completely gone already at the scrambling time, okay? And um, you, therefore there's what's sometimes called a firewall at the event horizon. I put a star there because it can't really be at the event horizon, but somewhere near the event horizon, um, which destroys anyone who falls in. Uh, and then, so that's an extreme modification of number three. There's just no interior at all. And if you don't even care about there being an interior, why should these modes be entangled in the vacuum? They can be doing anything. In particular, the, the information can just be, be, be coming out um, just fine. Um, you know, on the other hand, you know, why should this happen for black holes, but not for the CMB, right? We already saw this rule that stuff comes in in the vacuum when the space time is expanding is good in cosmology. And so why shouldn't it be good for black holes too, right? And you know, so if we're gonna 
accept this firewall, we really have to be forced into it. It shouldn't be something where we just say, oh, you know, fine, problem solved. Um, so let's assume there's no firewall and then see how, how we do. Well, uh, yeah. So if, if there were a firewall in the cosmology sense, what we'll see as BMD? Um, well, we might not even exist to look at it. It's hard to, hard to know because, uh, you know, in cosmology right now, right here, right now is somebody's horizon. Um, so, uh, oh, oh, so sounds painful. Yeah. Yeah, and like we discussed, you know, that horizon's been around for longer than the scrambling time. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, so let's go with no firewall and see where we get. Um, okay, so then we need this picture that Hawking had, right? This picture of the whole space time, which I drew somewhere. Uh, this picture, okay. Um, th let's say, assume this is, picture is true, maybe everywhere except right up in this corner here, because right up in that corner, it's true that the curvature is large. Um, but then um, you see this, to get from the shell, you know, the information in the infalling shell out to the place where the Hawking radiation is being radiated from, um, you need a ridiculous amount of non-locality. You know, on that dash slice that I drew, um, you know, the space-like distance between the infalling shell and the, and the place where the Hawking radiation is coming out at late times is, you know, of order 10 to the 97 meters for Sagittarius A star, right? So you need sort of order one non-locality over distances of order 10 to the 97 meters, okay? And, and that's what I mean, you know, when I say that space-time has to be emergent, right? You need to have this reliable information transfer, not just a little bit, not just, you know, e to the minus s fidelity information transfer, but order one information transfer at space-like separation over 10 to the 97 meters for the information to get out. And that's just not gonna happen unless the semi-classical picture of the space-time is deeply, fundamentally wrong, at least for some questions, all right? Any questions? Uh, Herman? 10 to the 97. Yes, I, I said evaporation time. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 nine, nine, seven. No, no, not nine point seven. For Sagittarius A star, it's m cubed. In empty space, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, of course, yes, absolutely. I'm not an astrophysicist, Edward. You know. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, actually, the CMB feeds black holes, so no black holes are evaporating right now. Yeah. Um, unfortunate. Okay, um, so, so this is one way of seeing the extreme modification which is necessary. Um, another way, which I guess Jeff talked about last week, so I don't know how many of you were also here last week, but I'll say this a bit quicker. Um, so you can compute this thing called the page curve, which gives you the plot of the von Neumann entropy of the Hawking radiation as a function of time. And if you believe Hawking, he says that, well, since you just keep getting these sort of halves of entangled pairs over and over again, then the entropy of the radiation is just growing, 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 growing until the black hole is gone and then it plateaus at some value, which is the entropy of the final mixed state of the radiation. Um, this is for a black hole you made in a pure state. Um, on the other hand, if the evaporation is unitary, then the radiation has to come out in a pure state. So at some point this curve has to turn over and go back down to zero. Um, and so if you think about it, um, you know, if you compare this part of the curve and that part of the curve, right, to restore unitarity, then the, the slope of the curve uh, measured in Schwarzschild time um, has to be different at order one, right? You know, this is increasing with some order one slope. This is decreasing with some order one slope. And uh, somehow you've got to see this order one change in this simple thing that you can compute. Um, you know, which is another, somehow to make this happen is again a major change in effective field theory. It's not just a small correction to Hawking's calculation. Um, so the time at which this turns over is the so-called page time. It's a time which is of order the entropy of the black hole times the inverse temperature. 
So note that this is longer than the scrambling time, right? The scrambling time was log s, this is s. So, um, and, the, and the page time is important because this is the time where the entropy in the interior modes, right, the ones that purified the modes in the Hawking radiation, um, exceeds the entropy of the black hole. And so that's where we start having this tension with, uh, with uh, property number one, that the entropy should be A over 4G. If the entropy is A over 4G, then you might say that the modes in the interior somehow can't have more degrees of freedom than A over 4G, whereas effective field theory really tells you that they do. Uh, and so that's somehow this fundamental tension. Okay, that's the end of, oh, sorry, one more slide for the introduction, sorry. So, okay, and then we'll be done with the introduction. So, so what do we mean? So I said space-time should be emergent, but so far I define that rather negatively, right? I said we need to, we need to massively change or disrupt our picture of space-time, but you know, that saying this, I sound like Nima, right? So, so I wanna say something more constructive. What does it mathematically mean to say that space-time is emergent? Okay, what does it actually mean? What are the equations? You know, what's the theory where you see how it's emergent? Um, so the answer to this is not obvious um, by any means, um, but a promising proposal, which I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk trying to convince you of, um, is that there should be some linear encoding map, V, from the Hilbert space of low energy effective field theory, gravitational effective field theory, which does have a metric operator and so on, um, to some fundamental Hilbert space, some fundamental set of degrees of freedom um, that don't live in the gravitational space time. You know, they're not you know, fields that are labeled by points in the gravitational space time. They may be labeled by something, but it's something else. Um, and then in order for this to work, um, there are two consistency conditions that we need. Um, the first one is that the image of V in the fundamental Hilbert space is small. So in other words, there are many fundamental states where space-time fails to emerge, um, states where somehow the semi-classical picture is wrong. And so in any theory with emergent degrees of freedom, this is gonna be true, right? In the standard model of particle physics, there's a state that has this podium here. And if I tap on the podium, there are some low energy degrees of freedom inside called phonons. Um, but you know, the standard model also has states where the podium isn't there. And then those, it doesn't make sense to talk, talk about the phonons in the states where the podium isn't there. Um, and so these states that aren't in the image of V are like that. They're states where somehow the things are too excited for the emergent description to be useful. Um, Secondly, um, the inner product of H effective um, should be at least approximately preserved by this encoding map V. Um, um, at least for many states in H effective, maybe for all, um, we'll discuss that as we go on. Um, and the reason why you want this is to ensure that the quantum measurement theory of low energy effective field theory lifts to H fundamental, right? Because in quantum mechanics, the inner product is physical. So if you mess up the inner product in some big way for low energy effective field theory, then you'll see observable deviations from low energy effective field theory. Um, and we want at least some of those, but on the other hand, we don't wanna to totally give it up low energy effective field theory altogether because it works pretty well in this room, okay? So if we just tear up everything, then we're probably gonna mess up what happens in this room as well, okay. Why would you give that to the video? Well, the, the first thing I would say is kind of the same thing here, which is that quantum mechanics is linear and I wanna preserve quantum mechanics. Um, on the other hand, I am gonna to have to make some compromises eventually about the inner product. And so it's conceivable that one should have to make compromises on linearity also. Um, in practice though, that seems very dangerous because as soon as this map is nonlinear, you can amplify mistakes uh, in a pretty bad way. Um, and so if I can get away with explaining everything that I know with having it be linear, it feels safer to have it be linear. I think that's the best I can say. Um, of course, eventually we wanna have some, you know, we wanna drive this map from string theory or something but, and see that it's linear, but we haven't done that. Um, yeah. Sorry, what? Yeah, yeah, space time is emergent, that's correct. 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, that's so in, in, that's already true in ADS CFT, right? Boundary time is not emergent, but the time in the bulk is emergent. Yeah, yeah in that case, the, there's a boundary time which is not. Um, it depends on the example. So I, I, I will say ADS CFT is an example of this, and in that case, there's boundary time. Um, but yeah, in general, some version of this, I would like it to be true in a closed universe as well, and uh, then I don't think there will be some well-defined boundary time. Um, so, so the the easiest way to impose these consistency conditions is to just take v to be an I, I, approximate isometry. Um, you know, meaning a map where if I take v dagger v minus the identity uh, and I compute the operator norm, I get something that's small. Say in the black hole case, something that's exponentially small in the black hole entropy. Um, and we'll see in a mo in a moment that there are many situations where this is the right thing to do. Um, Eventually, though, we'll see that to really understand the black hole interior and the information problem, we have to do something more subtle than this. Okay, and so that's kind of where I'll aim to get at the end of the talk. Um, so here's the plan for the rest of the talk. I introduction has gone on for half the talk, but that's fine. Um, so I'll first explain in more detail how this idea of emergent space-time, the map V and so on, works in ADS-CFT, where we feel comfortable. Um, then I will talk about the non-isometric version of this idea where this formula is wrong and how that's what you need to understand the black hole interior. Um, and then I'll close theoretically with some comments on cosmology, although most likely I won't get to them. Okay, um, so that's the end of the introduction. Any more, any more high level questions, concerns, complaints uh, before we go on to get into some details? Um, so let's first go to ADS CFT. This is our best understood theory of emergent space time um, and see what we can learn, um, say, in the vicinity of the vacuum uh, before we try to start thinking about black holes. Um, so I don't, did anyone talk about ADS CFT before in the school? I don't. I can skip it. I know, I know you know what it is, Juan. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, okay. It says quantum gravity in asymptotically ADS, which is this can-like space-time, is equal to some quantum field theory living on the boundary. Okay, some non-gravitational quantum field theory. Um, and this is, this is really a quantum correspondence, right? So if you have a state in the bulk, um, where the geometry looks something like this, it's in one-to-one -one correspondence, which is state and boundary Hilbert space. Um, you know, things like the Hamiltonian in the bulk is the Hamiltonian in the boundary, the angular momentum, et cetera. Um, and there's a rule that if you take a, a local operator in the bulk and you pull it to the boundary, so this R is the radial coordinate, then you get a local operator in the boundary theory. Okay, so this kind of ADS CFT 101. Um, and in particular, since the Hamiltonians line up, you know, perturbations of the vacuum, little ripples in the Escher picture, um, correspond to low energy states, while um, uh, high energy states in the dual CFT correspond to states where some piece of this has been eaten by a black hole. You know, I tried to use this figure in, in something for MIT News, and I got in trouble with the lawyers because apparently there's a copyright on this. I was going to sell it. I mean. Um, so, um, in ADS CFT, I would say it's clear that space time is emergent, right? Because from the CFT point of view, there are no objects in the fundamental theory that are labeled by, you know, the, where you are in the space time. The space time has no fundamental role in the CFT. You can have it in some approximation some of the time, but if you just look at the fields in the CFT, they're, they, you know, they live in this boundary auxiliary space time and they're not labeled by points in the bulk. Um, Okay, so that was ADS-CFT 101, now ADS-CFT 102. Um, so there are two features of ADS, which um, I would say give crucial evidence for why you should understand this emergence of space-time in terms of this linear encoding map V. So the first feature um, is what I'll call the quantum extremal surface formula. Um, 
So this has a long history. The first version of it was proposed by Ru and Takenagi, and then people kept, you know, but it, it, it was rather restricted, and then people kept adding refinements. So then I'm, you know, the, the last version was by Engelhart and Wall. Um, so I'm just telling you the last version here. Um, so the idea is if you want to compute in the dual CFT, the entropy of a quantum state on a boundary region R. So here the bulk is two plus one dimensional. The boundary is one plus one dimensional. Time is going up. So, so a, a region is one dimensional here. This is a sub region of the boundary time slice, which is this circle. I would say I want to compute the entropy, the von Neumann entropy of some state uh, or the reduced state on that region. Okay, so then the rule is, um, it looks a little scary. I'll, I'll flash the fine print here, but you don't have to worry about it too much. Um, so you take um, a co-dimension two surface in the bulk, which here is just a line whose boundary is the boundary of R. So that's this line XR. You compute the area of XR, divide by 4G. You add to it the entropy of bulk fields that are in between XR and R. So this is a bulk spatial region, little r, right? I compute the entropy of the bulk fields in the spatial region, little r. I extremize over XR. And if I get more than one extremum, then I minimize to find the one that computes the entropy, OK? And there's some fine print here. XR is homologous to R. OK, the domain of dependence of R is called the entanglement wedge, which is this wedge of cheese here, WR. Okay. So this is a rather remarkable formula when you think about it, right? It's a gravitational formula for computing boundary entropy. Uh, and not just, you know, vague, boring, coarse-grained entropy, but real von Neumann entropy, right? The kind of entropy that's zero in a pure state, OK? Um, I, I still don't know why Ru and Takenagi, I guess Shinsei is here, had the courage to, to propose this radical generalization of the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, but I'm glad that they did. Mm. Um, so that's feature number one, um, is this amazing quantum extremal surface formula. Um, the second feature, which kind of points the way towards how to think about emergence, is this idea of subregion duality, which says that any bulk observable, um, which is supported in the entanglement wedge of a boundary region R, um, can be represented or reconstructed, I don't know where that word came from, um, as an operator in the boundary CFT, but an operator with support only in the region R. Um, so like in this picture, uh, if I have an operator which whose support lives inside the wedge, then I can represent it in the boundary theory as an operator just living here. Um, so, and in fact, in the vicinity of the vacuum, there's a formula for how to do this. So you have some point X here, which is living in the entanglement wedge, and then there's some well, it's not quite a function. It's a rather sensitive distributional object, but there's an object that you integrate in the boundary theory over the domain of dependence of the region R times the operator O, which you would have gotten had you taken the operator here and pulled it to the boundary. Um, but you don't pull it to the boundary. You leave it in the bulk. You use this smearing kernel, and you get some formula um, for how to represent it in the dual CFT, just as an operator living in R. Um, and there's some systematic way of computing corrections to the formula. Now, this subregion duality can lead to rather surprising conclusions. Um, so here I've drawn a time slice of the bulk with three boundary regions, region one, region two, region three. Um, I've drawn the, the entanglement wedge, or really its intersection with the time slice for region one is this shaded green region, for region two, this one, for region three, this one. Um, and then the funny thing is if you think about some information in the bulk, so say there's a spin sitting here at this dot and I want to know whether it's up or down. Um, well, that information um, is not accessible from just having region one, just region two, or just region three because it's not in any of the gray wedges. Um, but it is accessible or you can represent it as an operator either on the union of region one and two, the union of one and three, or the union of two and three. So there's this redundancy in where this information about what's going on in the bulk is encoded in the boundary fundamental description in terms of the conformal field theory. So you know where is the information? Somehow it's not in any of the pieces, but it, it is in the unions of the pieces, um, which is somewhat counterintuitive. 
Now, the right mathematical framework um, for understanding this kind of thing, both of these things, I would say, the QES formula and subregion duality, um, is this idea that ADS CFT is a quantum error correcting code. Um, so, more concretely, you have some Hilbert space of low energy bulk states here, low energy enough that there aren't any black holes. So, we're just sort of doing perturbative quantum gravity near the vacuum. Um, and then we imagine there's this holographic linear encoding map V that takes the Hilbert space of low energy effective field theory here and maps it into the Hilbert space of the boundary theory. Um, uh, and we think that this, you know, and then here we'll hope for net, well, we can, I think can have that V is approximately, at least up to exponentially small corrections, that it's an isometry. Um, so here, I'll just remind you that a isometry is a linear map that preserves the inner product. Um, and essentially that you can only have isometries from smaller Hilbert spaces to bigger ones, not from bigger to small, uh, where equality is included. It's allowed if equality is, if they're equal. Okay, so um, yeah, this has all been a bit philosophical. So let me try to give a, a rather concrete example of how this works. Um, I apologize for the people who have heard this from me a million times in the past, but I see lots of students, so I'll say it anyways. Um, so um, the simplest quantum error correcting code I know is the three Q-trait code, um, which takes a single logical Q-trait. So a Q-trait is a three-state qubit, zero, one, and two. And so it takes a single logical Q-trait, and then the encoding map sends it to three physical q trits like this. So there's an encoded zero like this, encoded one, encoded two. Um, this is clearly an isometry if you just stare at it for a sec, right? The states are obviously orthogonal because none of these have any overlap with these or these. Um, and um, it's also symmetric under cyclic permutations of the physical q trits, which will be useful for us in a moment. Um, I also want to emphasize that there's a lot of entanglement in all three of these states. If you look at any one of the Q-trits, the state looks maximally mixed. Now, one way of understanding why this code works is to note that um, you can find a unitary U12 on only the first two Q-trits with the property that this encoded states are just obtained by taking a product state of whatever logical state you wanted on the first Q-trit, tensor some fixed state on the second two, and then you just hit it with this unitary that has support only on the first two Q-trits. Um, so explicitly, this is the unitary, but you, know, you can figure it out, check it in your own time. Um, and so what this means is that um, if the system is in some logical state, psi tilde, right? So that means uh, some superposition of this basis states, right? Then I can figure out what that state is just by hitting the encoded state with U12, which just decodes and puts the state back in the first q trait And now I have the state there. So I can learn the state of the system only having access to the q trait one and q trait two. Um, and by symmetry, so because of the cyclic symmetry, right, that's also true. There's also going to be a U13 and a U23. And so I can recover the state from any two of the physical q trits but not from any one, because for any one, it's just maximally mixed. There's no information about the state. Um, now, in addition to logical states, you can also have logical operators, right? This is an encoded operator that acts within the code space with some matrix elements. Um, and in general, if I just pick the code arbitrarily, you would guess that in order to have a logical operator that does the right thing in the code space, the logical operator needs to have support on all three physical q trits. Um, but since we have this U12, we can do something kind of clever, right? We act with U12 to decode. While we're decoded, the information is in q trit one. So I just act with whatever operator I want on q trit one, and then I re-encode with U12 dagger. Um, and this gives me a representation of the logical operator that acts on the, in the right way on all the code states, but only has support on one and two. Um, and then by using the symmetry, we can also represent it on one and three or two and three um, by just using U13 and U23. Okay, so that's the three Q-trig code. Um, uh, and so this is, I think, quite reminiscent of this subregion duality that I talked about before, right? Where the same bulk information is accessible from different P 
pieces of the boundary at the same time. So let's make that more precise. So here now let's make an explicit analogy between holography and the three Qtrit code. Um, so the idea is that the three physical Qtrits, which are the pink dots here, are the local CFT degrees of freedom. So the boundary fundamental Hilbert space is the tensor product of Qtrit 1, Qtrit 2, Qtrit 3. Okay. Um, the logical Qtrit, the one logical Qtrit, is a field in the center of the bulk right there, the blue dot, okay? Um, and then the correctability that we just talked about of the three Qtrit code says that this information about what's going on in the center of the bulk, you can learn from any two of the pink boundary qubit Qtrits, which is just what we saw in ADS CFT. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. Earlier, you wrote an explicit formula for the construction in terms of the reconstruction in terms of an integral. Yeah. Um, so I know that you can do something like that in the causal wedge. Yeah. Is, is that also a, an explicit integral expression like that also possible in the wedge? Uh, as far as we know, no. I mean, there's some conjecture, which is that if you, instead of using the boundary Heisenberg operators, just those, you also allow their modular flows, then there's a conjecture that you can do it. And I think it's plausible, but I, yeah, I haven't been convinced by any of the arguments given that it's a proof. Um, it would be something more complicated than the formula that I wrote in any event. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a formal argument that it has to be true, um, which I'll actually mention in a moment. But I guess that formula applies to this case. I, in this case, formula applies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so, 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 yeah, so, because in this case, the causal wedge and the entanglement wedge are the same, right? And so, just to see that ADS CFT has this subregion duality property, that formula is good enough. Yeah. Um, so, so, this is the, this is subregion duality in the three Qtrit model. Um, you you also actually have the QES formula as well, um, and so let me try to explain that. Um, so, because of this U one two. I'll note that if I have a mixed logical state, right, I can represent it in the physical Hilbert space by just taking whatever mixed state I want, taking the tensor product with this fixed maximally entangled chi state on two and three, and then conjugating by U12. That just gives me the encoded version of the mixed state. Um, so now we can compute the von Neumann entropies in the fundamental description on the third q trit and the first two q trits. So on the third Qtrit, the U's don't matter because we trace out Qtrits one and two. And then we can throw out row one and we throw out half of chi. And then since chi was maximally entangled, we're left with a log three for the entropy on the third Qtrit. On the other hand, for Qtrits one and two, well, we can still throw out U12 and U12 dagger because the entropy is invariant under conjugation by unitary. So we're just computing the entropy of one and two for this state. But since this is a product state, that's the sum of the entropy of chi, which is log three, and then the entropy of rho tilde, okay? And so I claim that this is the same as the QES formula, because if we define this area over 4G to be log three, so in this picture that I had, I say the, you know, the length of this in Planck units is log three, um, then, um, this is the area term, and then this is the bulk entropy in the entanglement wedge, right? which is what I was supposed to get from the QES formula. Um, but here realized in this sort of totally trivial model where you sort of can't, where there can't be anything mysterious. Um, so um, I wanna emphasize that the area term here comes from the fact that chi was entangled, right? If chi was not entangled, then we wouldn't have gotten these log threes. Um, and that entanglement is essential to having a good code, right? If, if chi was a, was a product state, for example, then there would be no way that two and three could have the information if two didn't, ha if two didn't have it by itself. Um, okay. Um, now there's one more thing I can get out of the three Qtrit code before going on. Um, so you can say, okay, fine, Daniel. Um, you know, you gave us a nice, uh, theory of quantum gravity that um, accounts for a three-dimensional subspace of the 27-dimensional CFT Hilbert space, okay? But a few slides ago, you told me 
that an ADS CFT, a state in the bulk, corresponds to a state in the boundary. And now you're telling me that, no, it's only a three-dimensional subspace. So what about the other 24-dimensional subspace, which is orthogonal to the code space? What are those in the, in the bulk? Okay. Um, and my claim is that this is where gravity comes to the rescue. And those states are the microstates of a black hole which swallowed our bulk point. Mm -hmm. And so that's also a valid gravitational state. You just have a black hole here that ate the point. Um, and the microstates of that black hole account for the rest of the boundary Hilbert space. Okay. Now that may seem a bit arbitrary here, but you'll see in a moment that this picture sort of works in more general models as well. Okay, so that's it for the three QTRIT code. Um, I'll go on to tensor networks uh, to connect with the morning talk in a sec, but let me ask again if there are more questions before then. Yeah. Is the intuition here that if you're outside of the code space, the information was locked in the black hole? Um, no, it is there. I mean, this black hole does have microstates, right? It's a 24 dimensional Hilbert space of microstates. Um, yeah, I think it's better to just say that the, this, the, this part of the space time failed to emerge, as I was saying. Yeah. Well, so. Yeah. So you said that the two uh, 24 dimensional subspace that it described the black hole, right? Yeah. And, and how, how it, it is derived, uh, described? So it depends on the theory, such as string theory or the SFT. <laughs> and so, so please. Can you give more? Uh, well, I mean, this, this is a theory in and of itself. It's a toy model. So, I mean, so certainly string theory is much richer than this model, right? It's a 27 dimensional Hilbert space. Um, so, in this model, I just sort of I have to give you a bulk interpretation of every state in the boundary theory to tell you that I've really solved the model. And, and I have, because I, there's a basis where three of the states are the code states. And I told you they're the states of that spin in the center. And then there's the rest of the basis is the 24 black hole microstates. And I the interpretation is just those are the microstates of that black hole. Um, what this model doesn't do is tell you what's going on inside the black hole. And that's what I'm going to return to at the end of the talk. So more is needed to understand that. So, so this theory based on an isometric V is sort of for understanding outside of black, you know, what goes on outside of black holes. Um, yeah. You want to put logical qubits in the bulk and uh, physical qubits on the boundary, but not the other way around. Um, yeah, so it's because um, the in a, in a, in quantum error correction, you know the the physical qubits are the fundamental description, the one that's exactly correct that tells you what's really going on in the system physically, and that should be the CFT. In in ADS CFT, the the boundary theory is fundamental, and the bulk theory is emergent. So it's more natural to think of the emergent theory as being encoded into the fundamental theory in some little corner, you know, like what I was saying with the phonons in the table. Yeah. yeah. Uh, earlier you said that you wanted the black hole Hilbert space to, the number of microstates to be uh, A over 4G roughly. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you identify A over 4G as log 3. And you said that the number of microstates Sorry, it's different areas though, sorry. Yeah, so that, that area is the area of this line here, mm -hmm. which is different than the area here. Okay. Yeah, it's just di different areas, yeah. Um, okay, um, so I should go on and talk a little about tensor networks uh, since I was requested to. Um, so, um, you know, fine, three Q-traits, great. Um, you know, it's a bit much, right? We should, um, you know, we should try to have something that at least looks a bit more like the actual gravity that we see around us. And uh, I'm not going to be able to go all the way there, but at least I can try to have more than one degree of freedom in the bulk, all right? You know, try to have a volume's worth of degrees of freedom uh, so that it, there's some semblance of locality in the bulk. Um, so um, there, are, there are models like that, and so now I'll tell you about them. I guess I said such a model, but I should have said models. By now there are many. Um, I'll just tell you about one of them. Um, so th this was the first paper to do this. Actually, my, sort of my favorite way of doing this now is this one, which is the sort of based on random tensors, um, but it takes longer to get into, so I'll still tell you the, the simpler one. 
based on perfect tensors. Um, so um, the idea is, okay, I still can't do the CFT, you know, strongly coupled conformal field theory and the continuum is hard. Um, but instead of model it, modeling it by three qubits, I'll model it by n qubits all in a line. So you can think of it as a spin chain. Okay, I have a, n ch n, a chain of n spins. Um, and then I want to construct a two to the k dimensional subspace um, of the spin chain, um, which I interpret as the image of some encoding map from the bulk effective field theory to the set of low energy states in the CFT. Uh, and the way I'll, so we can think of this subspace um, as just being a big tensor T where um, it's got N plus K indices. Um, and this tensor is just telling me the encoding map. It's telling me, you know, this, I have some basis of the logical two to the K dimensional Hilbert space of bulk effective field theory. And I want to know how that basis gets mapped into the tensor product basis of the fundamental qubits living on the boundary. Um, so to tell you that, I need to tell you this big tensor T. Um, and of course, I'm going to tell you T, you know, a big tensor T um, by giving you a tensor network where I build it out of smaller tensors um, as we were learning about this morning. So, okay, this I'll go through quickly since it was just discussed this morning. So, you know, in tensor network, you build big tensors by contracting the indices of a bunch of small tensors. Um, so here's a tensor network that has three tensors. Each one has four legs. Uh, and so then the, the legs that are connected are summed over, contracted, the, and then the ones that aren't are dangling. Okay, so that's how you build a tensor out of a tensor network. Um, the tensors that I'm going to use um, are what we call perfect tensors. Um, as I said, you can also use random tensors, but I'll use perfect ones. So a perfect tensor is a tensor that has an even number of indices. Um, all the indices has, have the same range. And you have the property that if you do any balanced bipartition of the indices, any split into half and half, um, it's always a unitary transformation. Yeah. So that's, uh, it's not obvious that there are tensors like that, but they're, they do exist, but they do. Um, uh, and they're closely related to quantum error correcting codes. Um, in fact, the three Qtrit code, it's encoding map, right? The inner product of the i logical state into the physical basis. Um, gives you a four index perfect tensor um, where the range of each index is three. Um, the tensor that I'm going to use now is a six index tensor where each index runs from zero to one. Um, and so it's the encoding, it happens to be the encoding map of a standard five qubit code that encodes one qubit into five qubits. So a nice thing about perfect tensors is that you have an, if you have an operator here, which is contracted with um, up to half of the indices of the tensor, I can replace it by an operator that's contracted with the other half of the indices of the tensor, and I get the same object as far as the outgoing legs are concerned. Um, and this is not deep. I just take O prime to be T dagger O T. I take this here, I put it there. The T and the T dagger cancel because it's unitary uh, when you split it into half and half, uh, and then you get O T over here. Okay, so pretty simple. Um, if, you, um, if you don't do a balanced bipartition, but you split it into fewer and more legs, then what you'll get is always an isometry from the fewer legs to the more legs. Okay. Now, um, this is the tensor network that we're going to use. Um, so the idea is you tile the hyperbolic plane um, with pentagons. Uh, in the center of each pentagon, you stick one of our six index tensors. Um, since it's a pentagon, you contract five of the legs of the tensor through the side of the pentagon. And then you leave the last leg, because remember, it's a six index te tensor. You leave the last leg free. That's these red dots here. Those are free indices. And you go out you know, as far as you want. Then eventually, you know, since things should be finite, you stop. Um, and then you're left with a bunch of white dots at the end. Um, and then we view this as um, an isometric encoding map from the red dots to the white dots. Okay, and so this is our V. This is our holographic encoding map that takes the, the red dot Hilbert space, which is the Hilbert space of bulk effective field theory, into the white dot Hilbert space, which is the Hilbert space of the boundary CFT. 
and it's it's isometric because as i said if you if you think about it right you can always if you look at this network as you go out layer by layer you're always going from fewer indices to more indices and so you're just combining together a bunch of isometries um, you can then use this pushing operation to do operator reconstruction. Um, so for example, sorry, I drew the picture in another way here. I drew the dual thing to make it more clear. Um, this here is a dangling leg. I have an operator here, I feed it in, and then say I wanna reconstruct it over here on the boundary. Well, I can view it as being the identity on these two legs, I can push it onto these three. Then this one I can push onto those three, this one to those three, and so on, and that way I can push the operator out to an operator in the fundamental description that's just living on this subregion here. And so this thing is in the entanglement wedge of this subregion. Um, this green one over here, I can push there. But of course I have a choice, right? Instead of sending this one this way, I could have sent it that way and then got in some reconstruction like that. And so you can see again, the redundancy of the code. Um, and S in the Qtrit code, right? You can complain that this, since this is an isometry, it's only giving you a bulk interpretation of some subspace of the Hilbert space, um, but you can get the rest by including black holes. And so here's the simplest thing. So, the, so you get black holes by removing tensors. So say I just remove one tensor in the center. Well, before there was one input leg, but now there are five, okay? And of these, so this is a two to the five dimensional input. Now, two of the states are just the ones I would have gotten by putting the tensor back. So those don't have the black hole, but then I interpret the rest. Oh, what happened? My internet connection is unstable. Okay. Um, I interpret the rest of the states as being microstates of this black hole, which is sort of one ADS radius in size. Um, and then if I make a bigger black hole, I remove more tensors and I, I get more states. And I can keep going until eventually I removed all the tensors. And now I just have the encoding map as the identity. And now every state in the dual CFT has been accounted for um, by including large enough black holes. Um, now, I want to emphasize that the things I just said are not special to these models. You know, I, I use methods that were special to the models to show you that the things are really true. Um, but they're general features of quantum error correcting codes. And so in fact, um, there's a triple relationship in quantum error correcting codes between the idea between having the quantum extremal surface formula, having subregion duality, and having this formula that was first written down by these people relating bulk and boundary relative entropies. Um, so there's sort of if and only ifs in all these directions. Um, this theorem um, I first proved in an exact setting, and then there's a bunch of people who have been sort of gradually increasing the the level of generality you know making it approximate dealing with the special subtleties when the hilbert spaces are infinite dimensional um, but this picture has kind of held up through all the generalizations um, i think some of the generalizers are here did i see elliot for example somewhere i think i saw elliot before oh yeah there he is hi elliot yeah um Okay, so that's it. That's all I was going to say for ADS CFT. So now I'm happy to have any more questions about this, or in the last 15 minutes, I'll just get as far as I can to now go back to the black hole information problem and try to generalize this to be able to deal with Hawking's paradox. Um, so, okay, any other questions? It's happy. Yeah. How does space emerge? Um, well, I don't know, I, because there's this map V, right? If you ask me, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I can, I mean, I guess I'm telling you at the level of equations how it emerges. Um, yeah, if you ask me for some more detailed picture of what's going on in the bulk, I'm not sure. Yeah, somehow, somehow, you know, you have these boundary qubits, right? And there are just very some there are some very special states that these boundary qubits can be in you know these states where they have this nice long range entanglement and power law correlation and the energy is low and if you look at correlation functions they're behaving as if you had some nice space time there and as you start so that's where it does emerge and then as you start deviating from these states 
you know, allowing states that are a bit more energetic, then that entanglement starts going away. And those nice correlation functions start getting more complicated. The boundary entropies uh, start being extensive instead of just area law. Um, and as you make this black hole bigger and bigger, you include more and more states, you know, you just get less and less of these space-time-like features. I don't know, that's the best I can say. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is a relative entropy in a subregion. So, so b basically, if boundary relative entropy equals bulk relative entropy, right? Relative entropy is a measure of distinguishability. And so they're, if they're equal, it kind of means that you haven't lost any distinguishability when you go from bulk to boundary. And so somehow you can fully distinguish the bulk states just by looking in the boundary subregion. And that should mean that you should be able to reconstruct, which is this subregion duality. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit of a subtlety here because um, when you go to higher orders in G Newton, this one kind of breaks down in a more serious way than these ones. I mean, the, the, and then there, so then you have to, the way, so th this, this is true as stated through order G to the zero. And when you go to higher orders in G Newton, the edges start fluctuating and you have to worry about, oh, if you're right near the edge, then sometimes you're on one side and sometimes you're on the other. And that messes up subregion duality right near the edge. It also messes this one up a little bit. Um, QES, uh, I feel like the jury is kind of still out on this validity of QES to higher orders in perturbation theory. I, I have, I go through phases. Yeah. It's certainly true through order G to the zero, but but at higher orders, I don't know. Yeah, Edward. If you consider a fraction to any order, the energy is far away from the QES. So it's clear that that means the transition is definitely in the way. I'm yeah, 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 the issue is near the surface. That's right. Yeah, yeah, so away, I, yeah, for the stuff away, I agree. The bulk entropy has to contribute. That's right. Um, yeah, but, but I think the, the last word on the fact that it's flush, fluctuating here, I mean, one of the things that confuses me, right, is if you try to derive QES from the path integral, you get it by a, a, by a saddle point approximation. And usually the saddle point approximation isn't, you know, the corrections to that aren't also an extremum, right? So, so that, that's the thing that confuses me. Um, on, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the, I haven't seen a better formula. So I don't, I don't know uh, what we're supposed to believe at higher orders. Um, I mean, Netta and Aaron will say they think it should be true to all orders, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. Just to take a little bit, I think they said that the QES was in the original classical statement because it does not agree with some application. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not certain that they believe it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would like to understand what exactly is true at higher orders, but I'm a bit confused. You also have to worry about graviton fluctuations near the surface, which gets very confusing. The gauge fixing gets confusing. Um, yeah. No, no, it's, it's statements about the relationship between low energy effective field theory and the fundamental non-perturbative description. So each of these things is an equality where on one side you have a fundamental thing and on the other side you have the effective thing. So it's a statement about how the effective thing is embedded into the fundamental description. And this is relating various such statements. Um, well, if you knew this map V, you would really know that, right? So here I'm just sort of characterizing the map V, but to really know V, that's part of having a theory of quantum gravity. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me just see how far I can get uh, with, the, with the black hole information problem. And, uh, as expected, I'll skip the comments on cosmology. Um, so we've discussed now how to think about the emergence of space-time in the vicinity of the vacuum in ADS, um, but we would like to do something similar for the black hole interior. So here, going back to Hawking's picture, I have this Cauchy slice that I drew before, where we have these Hawking modes that become the Hawking radiation, which I'll call capital R going out, 
we, inside the black hole, we have right moving modes, which are the ones that are entangled with the Hawking mode and Hawking's calculation. And then we have also left moving modes that keep track of whatever you might have thrown into the black hole, including say the shell that you formed it out of, okay? Um, and if we're gonna follow this game of we wanna take the Hilbert space of effective field theory on the, you know, in the bulk and map it into some fundamental description, um, which here we would take to be the set of black hole microstates together with the radiation. So since we're viewing the radiation as sort of weakly coupled and separate from the black hole. If you want to make this precise, you can have this be the CFT and this be some bath that it's coupled to, but I think the idea should be more general. Um, and then there should be some encoding map where it takes the stuff that's inside the black hole, these left and right moving modes, it maps them into the black hole microstates. And then this tensor, the identity on the radiation gives you the, the full encoding map that you need to deal with both the black hole and the radiation. So this would be the natural guess for how to take what we learned in ADS CFT and generalize it to include the black hole interior. Um, the basic problem though, and which I think is really the essence of the information problem, um, is that at late times, there are more of these interior modes than there are degrees of freedom of the black hole. You remember, because the page time was the time where that starts being true. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, you can't have an isometry from a bigger Hilbert space to a smaller one and that means that if we're gonna have a map V that takes the interior degrees of freedom and sends them to the Hilbert space of black hole microstates, it can't be an isometry. Um, but then what are we supposed to do with these consistency conditions that we had, right? We wanted to preserve the inner product, right? We wanted to map into a small subset of the states compared to, the, the, compared to all the non-geometric states. And uh, before we did that by saying the map was an approximate isometry, but now we have to think of something else, okay? And so I, I personally was hung up on this point for quite a while because it seemed like if it's not an isometry, you know, you're, you're violating quantum mechanics. Um, so the thing that I would say we've learned in the last few years um, is to stop worrying and love the non-isometric nature of V. Um, that's a cultural reference. Um, so um, it may sound scary, this uh, non-isometry, um, but if you understand it properly, um, then actually it explains the difference between Hawking's calculate version of the page curve and Page's version of the page curve um, without having to give up on effective field theory to the extent that we would have already seen violations of it here in this room. Okay, uh, and so this last part will be based on a paper from, I guess, the year before last. Um, so in more detail, um, the essence of the story um, is the following. So um, what we wanna say is that in the Hilbert space of effective field theory, right, the domain of V, um, there is a large set of null states which are annihilated by the holographic map V. Um, so this sounds like a huge violation of effective field theory. I'm taking lots of perfectly kosher effective field theory states and just saying, no, they're gone. In the fundamental description, they don't exist. Sounds bad. Um, but I claim that in fact, the fact that all these states are gone cannot be detected by any observer who doesn't do something of exponential computational complexity. Here, exponential in the entropy of the black hole. Um, so in the language we were discussing before, right, where we had the three options, we had the, the finite black hole entropy, the unitary S matrix, and the validity of effective field theory away from regions of strong curvature and energy density. The proposal is that, you know, we want to give up three, right? We agreed where space time is gonna be emergent. And the way we're gonna give it up is we're gonna say that effective field theory is only valid for states and observables of sub-exponential complexity. Um, wherever there's not large energy density or curvature. And so this italicized part here is the new thing. So we're saying effective field theory is badly broken. If you look at things that are exponentially complex, you know, you have this non-locality at 10 to the 97 meters, um, but you can't detect that non-locality if you're a computationally bounded observer. Okay, and so that's the, the proposal. Um, and in fact, we were able to construct explicit solvable models um, where one, two, and three star are all true in a way where you can really prove it. Um, 
and so, you know, of course, these models are toy models. They're not, um, you know, realistic. But it shows that there's not a contradiction between one and two and three star, because we have an example that does all three. Um, and so at least in these models, there is no information problem. You know, we have a version of one, two, and three, which is correct, which are all true at the same time. Um, so um, I'm basically out of time. So I'm just going to give you the, the simplest possible model um, that illustrates the phenomenon. Right? So um, let's say we have an orthonormal basis of e to the s states, you know, number state number one, state number two, going up to state e to the s. Um, now, um, we learn, um, well, in kindergarten, um, maybe, yeah, maybe only in the former Soviet Union, um, that there are no states that are orthogonal to all of these. Um, but when s is large, um, it's actually quite easy to make a state which is nearly orthogonal to all of these states. Um, so here's an example. I just do a uniform superposition of all the states. So if I compute the inner product of my state psi with any one of these, I get e to the minus s over two. Um, so, uh, you know, almost zero, pretty close to being orthogonal, right? And, you know, that was so much fun, let's make another one. Here's another one. I just throw in all same superposition, but now I throw in an alternating sign. So if you compute the inner product of these two, it's again exponentially small. And it's, it's also exponentially small with all of those. So look, hey, I got another one. You know, this is great. I keep getting more almost orthogonal states. Uh, and I don't need to stop here, right? So, so now here, let's, let's try to put this in the black hole language. So let's say I have some interior state, so some state of the left and right moving uh, modes inside the black hole, and I want to define its encoded version. The encoded version is just going to be a sort of uniform superposition. Uh, there should be a capital B here. This is a basis of the black hole microstates. Um, but then I sprinkle it with phases that I choose randomly. Okay. So this is a candidate encoding map. And I'm going to do this in a situation where the dimensionality of L and R is much bigger than the dimensionality of B. Um, but even when it is, well, if I compute the inner product of the encoded states, right? So if I take, you know, V, I, V dagger J, right? I get this. And if you look at this, well, if I equals J, the phases cancel. I sum over the microstates of the black hole. I get one. That's good. So I preserve the inner product. I preserve the norm of the states. Um, but then if i is not equal to j, then this is like a random walk, right? I'm summing up, you know, b phases, so I should get square root of b. But then I'm dividing by b, so I get 1 over square root of b, which is exponentially small in the entropy of the black hole, okay? So in this way, I can make a ton of almost orthogonal states, way more than the Hilbert space dimension naively allows. Um, this has some name in computer science, which I never remember. Jordan, somebody, I don't know, can some computer scientist tell me? Jordan Levin, Linden, some, uh? J Jordan somebody lemma, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's the lemma that you can fit a lot more almost orthogonal states in Hilbert space than you might have thought. Um, yeah, which is what I said, yeah. Um, so um, this is, so, so now, now, now clearly the V isn't an isometry, right? Because I'm going from bigger to smaller. But nonetheless, for all these states in the basis, I can preserve the inner product very well. Um, now, that's not quite what I said before. I didn't, before I didn't say just basis states. I said also states of sub-exponential complexity, which includes many superpositions of these. To, to prove that, you need a fancier model, which I don't have time to explain. But I can, in the fancier model, I can show that you can get this for all the sub-exponential states, not just for the basis states. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, here I would, yeah, here, I, yeah, I would say choose them randomly. But, but choose them once. Draw one sample. So, so okay, it's, it, this, this S with these usual existence proofs, right? What I can show is that generically this is true. But it's hard for me to give you a specific list of the thetas where it's provably true. Um, but it's true for almost all the choices. Um, OK. Um, maybe this will be the last thing I'll say, and then I'll stop. Um, so you can use this model to explain um, the quantum extremal surface calculation of the page curve that Jeff talked about. 
Um, so since Jeff talked about it, I won't explain the details of the calculation. Let's just see how it works in this model. So you have some, here's a cartoon version of Hawking state. You have, just get rid of the left moving modes inside for now, just we have some entangled state of the right moving modes inside and the Hawking radiation states. So this is my bulk effective field theory state, all right? Now I hit it with V. I pass it through our random phase holographic map. Okay, and I get an encoded version of the state, which you know, has the now a sum also over the black hole microstates with these random phases. Um, so this is the state in the fundamental description of the theory. And so what we wanna do is we wanna compute the entropy of the Hawking radiation. That's what we're supposed to compute for the page curve, the en entropy of capital R. Um, so let's start with the second Renyi entropy. So that's the trace of the reduced state of psi on the Hawking radiation. Okay, so you, know, you run it through, you get four phases with some, some indices you sum over. Um, and then when the dimensionality of the black hole Hilbert space is large, um, this is dominated by terms where the phases cancel in pairs. Um, and there's two ways for the phases to cancel in pairs. Um, one of the ways of canceling gives you one over B, and the other way of canceling the phases in pairs gives you e to the minus s, uh, the second Renyi entropy of the Hawking radiation from the bulk effective field theory point of view. Um, so um, in other words, the second Renyi entropy of the radiation in the fundamental picture is the minimum of either the black hole entropy or the bulk Renyi entropy of the Hawking radiation. Um, so the, the area term, right, this option arises from terms where B equals B prime, whereas this one arises from the terms where I equals I prime, right, in this uh, sum. That those are the two ways of canceling the phases. Um, so you can do a fancier version of this for the von Neumann entropy and you get the same answer. Um, and this is precisely what the result that Jeff talked about, right? So when, at early times, when the entropy of the Hawking radiation is small compared to the entropy of the black hole, then, um, the entailment wedge of the radiation is just the radiation itself, and you get this answer. But then at late times, when the entropy of the Hawking radiation is big compared to the black hole entropy, then um, it's better to include the island, and then you this entropy doesn't contribute, but the area does, and that's this contribution. So the area term takes over midway and gives you the decreasing part of the page curve. Now, I want to emphasize here that I did not take the QES formula as input here, and I also did not use Euclidean quantum gravity in any way, all right? Now, people sometimes want to say that Euclidean quantum gravity lies at the root of it here, but I want to emphasize I didn't use it at all. I just took the definition of entropy in this model, trace of mi minus trace of rho log rho, and I computed it, okay? Um, and what I got was the page curve, you know, from a sort of fully microscopic calculation um, in a concrete model um, based on a non-isometric code. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, so we see that inspired by the coding formulation of emergent space-time in ADS-CFT, um, we can make a model which realizes, you know, several of the desired features of a quantum theory of black holes, including the three features that seem to be in contradiction with each other, with this caveat that the space-time only emerges for sub-exponential observables. Um, so, you know, black hole entropy is finite, Effective field theory is valid, and the page curve of the radiation is computed and is consistent with both unitarity and the QES calculation. Um, you can develop this further to see that you have manifest non-locality, whereby by doing exponentially complicated operations on the radiation, you can create excitations in the black hole interior. So that's this non-locality at 10 to the 97 meters, but to take advantage of that non-locality, you need to do something exponentially complicated. Um, you can also do a dynamical version of this where you see explicitly that the, the S matrix is unitary for forming and evaporating a black hole. Um, so there's still many details to fill in, um, but I think it's an exciting time. Um, and there's some feeling in the community, although maybe not everyone agrees with every detail of what everyone else says, there's this feeling that we have this set of ideas um, which somehow together have dealt with the crux of Hawking's problem. Um, okay, so I had, I had these comments about cosmology, but maybe I'll just, uh, I'll leave uh, some things. Yeah, let's see. Well, it's only two slides. I don't know. Okay, yeah, it, 
I don't yet know how to do all this in cosmology, but I think that probably you're going to have to include the observer explicitly. Okay, that's all I was going to say. So thank you for listening. Yeah, what was your uh, metric of complexity? Um, circuit complexity. Yeah, are, are you asking depth versus uh, size or something? Or? I thought you, when you were talking about the, the rent, well, the near the orthogonal vectors, that is actually yeah. many in the dimension. Uh, was the complexity there the same as the complexity? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so the claim, the claim is that I can have a map V, which is non-isometric, right? but which approximately preserves the inner product of all states which have sub-exponential circuit complexity, meaning the circuit that prepares them from a product state. Here, there was no uh, uh, mechanical notion. Was the, the, basis factor, the basis factors were just number. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what I claimed is more than what I showed, right? So what I showed is that you preserve the inner product for a basis state. So let's think of these basis states as products, OK? So this is just the product basis, and I show you preserve the inner product of all the product states. OK. Now, that's nice, but of course, in the real world, we don't just have product states. Um, and my claim was that some version of this also preserves the inner product of everything I can get from a product state by acting with a, a circuit of sub-exponential complexity. OK. If I, if I can do an exponentially complex surface circuit, I'm clearly, this is clearly not going to work because because it's not an isometry. There are states in the kernel of V. And if I make one of those, it's not going to preserve the norm. Um, so, so like a consequence of what I'm saying is that everything in the kernel has exponential complexity. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you go in the other direction for this argument and uh, provide evidence for the existence of an exponential number of null states um, from Euclidean gravity? Um, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. So in the Euclidean gravity, I mean, one thing you can do is compute the page curve, and if you think about it hard enough, you'll probably convince yourself that means this map has a kernel. Um, you can also try to do it more directly. There's various papers where they try to make an overcomplete basis of the bulk states using the path integral, and then compute the gram matrix to find the rank, uh, and you find that the rank is consistent with e to the a over four g, even though it seems like there are a lot more states than that in the bulk. Um, yeah, so I think, I think the null state thing, probably everyone in this business has made their peace with, even if we all maybe put slightly words, different words and how to interpret it. Um, yeah. How restricted is it that we also require that this, this mass V allows us still to type of all on either side and have the same mass V moving forward? Yeah, so in our, in our model, um, it does that. Yeah, so that's called, uh, I think we called that equivariance. That was what I meant here. Okay. Um, I think so far, so, so our model has a, an oversimplification, which is that there are no interactions between left and right movers behind the black hole horizon. Okay. Now that's not true in the real world. Of course, there are, there are interactions. And so far, no one has made a model which exactly has this equivariant property and has interactions. And it seems a bit tricky to do that, but explicitly. But there was a paper by um, John Preskill and Isaac Kim where they showed that you can have it to very good approximation. And then the kind of my suspicion is that um, you can, by some continuity argument, say that there is an example where it's exactly true. I just can't write it down for you explicitly. I think, yeah. I remember in that paper, I think yours as well, the, the map could be can be described by just time evolving backwards one all the way to the formation of the black hole and then forwards in the other? Um, no, I don't, I don't want to endorse that in general. Yeah, so there was a paper, is Kenny here? I don't know, Kenny may be here. He and Oliver DeWolf wrote a paper doing that. Um, that, I would say, that works if you don't throw things into the black hole in the meantime. Um, but if you do, or if you do measurements, like, yeah, so if you do a measurement at late times and then try to evolve back, you get, you get a large back reaction. Um, this goes back to a tuft. Um, and I think you can't view our map that way, but our map still works in that situation. Yeah, yeah, but, but at least for some of the states, you can view it that way. Yeah, yeah. 
the effect field theory is invalid? Do you really mean like the local field description is invalid, or is this the general relativity gets replaced by a better effect field? No, I mean, I mean, I mean, really, this manifests non-locality, right? Where so where I can do a complicated operation on the Hawking radiation and create a particle in the black hole interior. And space like separation with the separation 10 to the 97 meters. So, you know, and, and like, and like definitely create it, not like with a small chance, but like, you know, probability one, I can be very close to one create. Um, yeah, so I think that's a, a very severe violation of locality. The, 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 Jordan, was the Johnson Lindenstrauss. Johnson Lindenstrauss. Okay, yeah, I can never remember this. Not Jordan, Johnson. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that old. It's uh, from the 80s or something. Right? Yeah. There are no more questions. Let's thank uh, Daniel again.